We're going to look at a message called Behold the Man. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for this opportunity that we have to gather together as brothers and sisters in Christ to open your word. Lord, we do not count it lightly. Help us not to see it as just something that is routine or mundane, but Lord, help us to see it as a privilege to gather together with like-minded brothers and sisters and to worship you through singing, through giving, through fellowship, and Lord, now to worship you through, through hearing the Word of God, to, through submitting to the Word of God. Lord, you have spoken to us most clearly through your Word, and it is your Word to which we submit to. And God, I ask that you would help every one of us to see Christ today. See Him as He is. Lord, I pray that you'd help me this morning to open my mouth, to preach your word, and to exalt Christ. Amen. So how many of you need glasses or contact lenses? Just keep your hands up a second. Wow. So that would be prescription glasses or readers. Okay, you, you can put your hands down. That, that actually kind of lines up with what the stats show, it says according to the Vision Council, 63.7% 63, of Americans wear prescription glasses or contact lenses. That would be 170 million people need contacts or glasses, some type of prescription for their eyes. Um, vision, the vision care market uh, in America is between 60 to $70 billion annually. I have had glasses, worn glasses or contacts for 30 years. Um, or 31 years, since I was 12 years old, uh, I have had contacts or glasses, maybe even younger. Um, but I would, you know, the, the routine is, is that you go annually to get your eyes checked on. You go every year to get a new prescription. And I spent over two years, the last two years, not going to the eye doctor. I just didn't go to the eye doctor. And so finally, a couple of weeks ago, two or three weeks ago, I went to the eye doctor and I went to to get my eyes checked. It had been a couple of years, and lo and behold, my prescription was pretty much the same as what it was two years earlier, but when I sat in the eye doctor's chair, and the eye doctor is there looking at me and examining me, he, he, put the, he had me take my glasses off, and he put the lenses over, the, the machine lenses over my eyes, and, and there's letters that are on the wall. And he, he would, he'd put one lens over my eyes, and he'd say, which one, tell me which one is better. One? or two, three, or four. Again, one, or two. And you know, my doctor is Dr. Bud Cloutier, and he says it in a very, if you know Dr. Bud, one, or two. <laughs> Sounds like Dr. Bud, right? One, or two. Vision, vision, which one's clear? Can you see correctly? You see correctly, and so I had to make a choice. And today, we're going to look at a text, and we're going to see people who don't see correctly, who cannot look at reality right in front of them and see correctly. Now, what they're seeing in front of them, in the, in the person of Jesus Christ, what they're seeing in front of them, according to human standards, they're probably judging accurately. But if they would have remembered all the things that Jesus had done, they would, have be, they would have maybe seen things a little different. But because they were forgetting all that he had done, all that he had demonstrated that he was, they were not judging accurately. And so in John 19, we're going to continue as we're walking through John, walking through his, his journey to the cross, where John 19, verses 1 through 11, let's see what we can see today about Christ. John 19, starting in verse 1. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe and Pilate said to them, Behold the man! When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. 
The Jews answered, we have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he has made himself the son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, Pilate said to him, you will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. So in our text today, we're going to behold things in our mind's eye as concerning Jesus. And we're going to consider those who are looking at Jesus through their physical eyes. And we're going to recognize and we're going to see that they are not judging accurately. They are not beholding Jesus for who he is. My prayer today is that we would see Jesus for who he is, that we would behold the man and see him for who he is. What will we see as we look at this text? What will we see in our mind's eye as we see this text? Well, the first thing we will see is that the king of glory is scourged like a criminal. The king of glory is scourged like a criminal. Did you see the first verse that we read in Luke and John 19? Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. Flogged him. The word flog there also means scourging, flog, to be flogged, to be scourged were, was the same thing. And Jesus is nearing the end of his trial, his mock trial, his, the sham trial. And Pilate clearly, as we see in this text over and over again, as we've seen the last two or three weeks, Pilate does not see any fault in him or any guilt in him that is worthy of death. So what's he going to do with Jesus? What's he going to do? He can, if he releases Jesus then he runs the risk of there being a riot. If he releases Jesus, he runs the risk of the Jews doing what they've done before and blackmailing him and running to Caesar and and telling Caesar that that, that, that Pilate has not done his job as he's supposed to have done. And and so he can tell that he he, he has to do the right thing here. And and, and notice in, in Matthew's account, Pilate recognized that there was a risk of an uprising. Look at Matthew 27, same account. Verse 24, so when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, trying to convince them that Jesus was not not guilty, but rather that a riot was beginning, he could see that a riot was beginning. So what was he going to do? Barabbas is released. Jesus, should he send him to be crucified? Well, he has an idea. Look look, Look at his idea. Luke's account tells us this. Luke 23, verse 16, I will therefore punish and release him. So Pilate says, I can't convince these people that Jesus is not guilty of what they're saying he's guilty of. They're saying he's guilty of being an insurrectionist, saying that people should not give honor to Caesar. They're saying he's guilty of declaring himself to be the king of the Jews, but I I, I can't find any evidence of that. I've interviewed him. I've interrogated him. He's he's not guilty, but but perhaps if I punish him, I'll be able to release him. Perhaps if I punish him, I'll be able to release him. And I think that's what Pilate is after. He's trying to, he wants to punish Jesus physically. And as you read in our text in John 19, show him to the crowd and to the chief priests and say, say, look, look. And maybe they'll be sympathetic towards Jesus and be okay with letting him go. But you know what's interesting? The one who knew that this was that was gonna, the, the, the one who knew that this was gonna happen, no matter what Pilate did, was Jesus. I don't know if you remember in Luke 18, Jesus said this. Luke 18, in verse 32, for he will be, speaking of himself, he will be delivered over to the Gentiles and will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him, and on the third day he will rise. Verse 34, the disciples, they understood none of these things. They didn't understand it. Jesus knew that this was his will. This was the will of the Father. Jesus knew that this was coming. Pilate is trying to work a system. Pilate is trying to figure out how he won't have the blood of this man on his hands. So Pilate is going to punish Jesus. What form of punishment is Pilate going to bring upon Jesus? What form of punishment would Rome give to their criminals, to their, the criminals that were the most, the most notorious criminals? It was 
flogging. It was scourging. Jesus is led away to be flogged, to be scourged. And so what takes place at this point? What takes place at this point when Jesus is led away? Pilate tells the soldiers, take this man and scourge him. What happens here? Here's what would happen to a victim of scourging. The criminal would be stripped naked. All of his clothes would be taken off. He'd be stretched out with cords. His arms would be stretched out. His legs would be stretched out, and he would be tied onto a pole that would be about three or four, three or four feet high. And his legs would be stretched out. His arms would be stretched out, tied to the pole, and he's completely naked. And then it would be common for this scourging, the instruments, the tools that would be commonly used would be a stick, a piece of wood with leather strips connected to the piece of wood and it was knotted and twisted leather strips. And at the end of those leather strips would be metal or bone that would be at the end. It would be common for this to take place for the purpose of ripping the flesh off. So here's what some historians say about the scourging. It says the weight of the metal or bone objects at the ends of the leather thongs would carry them to the front of the body as well as to the back and arms, the shoulders, arms, and legs down to and including the calves. The bits of metal would dig deep into the flesh, ripping small blood vessels, nerves, muscle, and skin. Listen. The, the purpose of the flogging, of the scourging, was to inflict such a severe beating to the point where the person would almost die. Actually, it was very common that those who were headed to crucifixion, they were scourged or flogged before many of them would die before they would ever reach crucifixion. So severe would be the scourging that the insides, the vital organs of the person being scourged could be seen. The bones could be seen. The bones were exposed because the flesh was ripped off. Roman historian Josephus says of Roman flogging, flogging means being cut open to the bones. Being cut open to the bones. This is flogging. And you see it in your mind's eye? Behold the man. So what, what happens next? He's flogged, and then look what happens next. John 19, verse 2 through 3, and the soldiers, now after he's flogged, they twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. And they came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and they struck him with their hands. So they, they take a crown of thorns and they press it. And you know, the crown of thorns, as we would see it, you know, small little thorns, twisted together, and this was not really the picture. The thorns would have been two or three inches long, and it's twisted together, and it's, it's thick thorns, and it's pressed down onto his head, into his skull, and there would have been blood dripping down over his eyes, just blood everywhere flayed open because of the scourging, and blood coming down. And what's interesting and compelling about this picture of a thorn Pilate allows the soldiers who had flogged Jesus to, it says there, to have some sport or some fun and to mock him. So they twisted the crown of thorns. Think about thorns. You remember Genesis 3, 17? Cursed is the ground. This is after the curse of sin. Adam and Eve have sinned and been exposed by God. And then the curse comes because of sin. Notice what the curse brings. Curse is the ground because of you. In pain, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. Prior to the curse, no thorns. After the curse of sin, thorns. Thorns that resulted from the curse of sin Jesus was now wearing on his head. Thorns that were the result of the curse were being pressed into his skull. And then also it says that a purple robe was placed on him. Purple was a color of royalty. Perhaps this robe even came from Pilate's quarters. Maybe it was brought out from Pilate's quarters. Maybe Pilate, in representing Caesar, would have a purple robe when he represented Caesar. And 
the royalty of Caesar. When he spoke for Caesar, perhaps he would wear a purple robe. But wherever the purple robe came from, they put it on Jesus. They're mocking him. He's a king. His crown is a crown of the curse of sin, a crown of thorns. It's pressing on his head, and he's, he's open wide, bleeding profusely. And you, if you, I've read, I read medical journals and, 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 and medical, uh, medical articles about what would have been happening in the body of Jesus after the scourging and after the pressure from the crown of thorns onto his skull. His blood pressure would have been through the roof. He would have been severely dehydrated. He would have, it, it was amazing. He lasted until the cross. So they're mocking him. And then they're striking him with their hands. These soldiers, undoubtedly the same ones that had flogged him and scourged him, are striking him with their hands and, and they're yelling, they're, they're mocking him by saying, Hail, King of the Jews. It's fun for them. It's a sport for them. So consider this. Christ, the author of creation, being struck in the face by those he created. This is utter horror. Bloodthirsty men taking breaks from the beatings so that fully strong men can continue the beating, the mocking, the blasphemy. You know, Jesus was accused of blasphemy, was he not? By the Pharisees. But the only blasphemy that was taking place was from the heart of the soldiers, from the heart of the Sanhedrin, and from the crowd. That's where the blasphemy was coming from, that the Son of God was being spit on, the Son of God was being mocked, the Son of God was being beaten as an innocent man. That's the only blasphemy that was taking place. How bad was the scourging? told you a little bit about physically what it would have looked like. What does Scripture say? about how bad the scourging was. Isaiah 52, 14 says, As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. What does that mean? It means that when people looked at Jesus after his scourging and his beating, it was hard to determine whether or not he still was human. That's how disfigured he was. Another reference would be the Messianic Psalm of David. In Psalm 22, it gives another picture of the horror of that day. Psalm 22, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I I find no rest. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a pot's herd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death, for dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. You, you see it? It's the same picture. It's the picture of the scourging. It's the picture of the flogging. So much destruction. So much opening of the flesh. I can count all of my bones. All of this done for us. All of the agony, the torture, the abuse, the beating, the flogging, the spitting, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. With his wounds, we are healed. Verse 10, Isaiah 53, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. It's amazing. It's beyond human comprehension. And when thinking about our mind's eye, it's hard for us to see that in our mind's eye. It's hard for us to close our eyes and to imagine and to picture what it was like. Scripture gives us a, 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 a clear picture of the brutality of what would have taken place. And Jesus did not say a word. The suffering servant did not revile in return. Like a lamb, Isaiah 53 says, like a lamb that is led to be slaughtered, he did not open his mouth. 
He did not retaliate. He did not fight. And in this point, in this point, that Jesus did not fight in return, did not retaliate in in return, this is one of the greatest examples of the differences between Christ and us. Because we are fighters. We retaliate. We speak up when we are wrong. Now listen, we cannot fully understand this because none of us are perfectly innocent. And to some degree, as we said a couple weeks ago or last week, to some degree we are hypocritical, all of us. Jesus was perfectly innocent. He did nothing wrong. Have you ever been wronged where you were innocent in a situation? How often do we not take it? How often do we not not say words, but we say words, we gossip, we're angry? How often are we mistreated and we mistreat in return? This is such a stark contrast. This is what we see in Jesus. He does not retaliate. He does not fight, but we're fighters. We like to get even payback, revenge. Cain kills Abel. Frederick Nietzsche famously says, revenge is the greatest instinct in the human race. Revenge is the greatest instinct in the human race. By contrast, the King of glory, the eternal God who became flesh, the perfectly innocent and spotless one was brutally beaten and scourged. He took the punishment that we deserve because of our sin and he did not seek justice for the inhumane treatment. In fact, what he did was he was submitting himself to the justice of God. The justice that sin demanded was the life of the spotless lamb. So he didn't seek justice for himself, but he submitted himself to the justice of God, to the wrath of God on sin. The king of glory submitted himself to the wrath of God on sin and is scourged like a criminal. Like a criminal. Can, can you see it in your mind's eye? One or two, which is clearer. Can you see it? The king of glory is scourged like a criminal. And the one who ordered that brutal beating, Pilate, the Roman governor, he's confused. He's confused. The one who ordered that, the Roman governor, he's confused about his authority. That's what we see next in the text. We've seen the scourging. We can see the scourging. We we can't comprehend it fully, but but we understand the words, and we can can get pictures in our mind of what it might would have been like. But the Roman governor, he saw, because he was the one who ordered, he ordered the brutal beating, but he didn't really understand who he was. He was confused about his authority. He looked back to the text. When Pilate heard this statement, what was the statement that Pilate heard? The statement that Pilate heard The statement that Pilate heard was that the Jews are now saying that Jesus is the Son of God. That's what Pilate heard. And so now it says, verse 8, when Jesus heard this statement, he was even more afraid. And he entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate heard. Pilate heard that Jesus was making himself out to be the Son of God. And Pilate had ordered the flogging of Jesus. Had ordered the flogging of Jesus. His plan was to elicit sympathy. And it didn't work. And the crowd shouted. The crowd shouted all the more for the death of Jesus. So, Pilate orders Jesus back into his headquarters. He says, where are you from? In essence, what he's saying is this. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. They said that you were trying to get people to rebel against Caesar. That's what they said. They said you considered yourself out to be a king of the Jews, and, 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 and I've, I can handle that thought that you are, think you're the king of the Jews, and, and clearly I don't think you're guilty of causing an insurrection, but the son of God? This is news to me. You're claiming to be the son of God. And then he says, so where are you from? Where are you from, Jesus? You know, history tells us that Pilate was a superstitious man. In fact, this is why 
his wife's dream about Jesus impacted him like it did. Notice what Pilate says later in Matthew 27. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. Notice it was after the declaration that Jesus was the Son of God. Why is, why, why is Pilate doing that? He's basically saying, I'm washing my hands of this guy. His blood's on your hands. I don't want to mess with the consequences that this might bring in case he's something that you don't recognize yet. That's the underlying idea going on here. Now the conversation continues. He asked Jesus where he was from. Jesus didn't answer. Look back to the text, verse 10, John 19. So Pilate said to him, you will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus doesn't answer, Pilate. And Pilate, in in essence, says, "Do, do you not know who I am? Have you, ever, have you ever heard the stories in the news where you have a politician that gets pulled over for speeding or some other traffic violation, and they get pulled over, and the officer, officer who is the authority walks up to the vehicle, and, and the person says, do you not know who I am? Right? I, th- I think this is the picture of what G- Pilate is saying to Jesus. Do you, you're not going to answer me? Do you not know who I am? Do you not see? Do you not understand? Do you know that I have authority to determine what happens to you? What does Jesus say? He didn't talk earlier, but now he wants to clarify something. What does he say? Verse 11, Jesus answered him. This time he answered, listen, Pilate, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. In essence, Jesus is saying, you are not who you think you are. You're not who you think you are. And you don't have the power that you think you do. What Jesus is saying to Pilate right here is, Pilate, your authority is borrowed. It's borrowed authority. It comes from above. It doesn't come from Caesar. You think your authority comes from Caesar. You are a minion of Caesar. But your authority comes from above. You would have no authority but that it would come from above. So imagine the scene. Picture the scene. Jesus is standing there. This is post-scourging. He's standing there dripping with blood. Body open. Bones can be counted undoubtedly leaning on something because he can't hold himself up. Crown of thorns on his head, purple robe over his shoulders, blood dripping down all over his face, and Jesus answers Pilate in that condition. Can you see it? And he answers Pilate, you don't have the authority that you think you have. Picture that. Think about that. Think about what Pilate is seeing. You remember I said we're going to see what they see? Think about what Pilate is seeing right here. Here is a man that is at the weakest and the lowest possible position a human being can be in, and he's looking at Jesus, and he's looking at Pilate and telling him, your authority is not where you think it comes from. You are not who you think you are. You don't have authority over me, only but what God gives you from above. Look at that. Pilate, royalty, authority, Roman governor, Jesus, bruised and bloody, dripping blood everywhere, unclothed, severely beaten. And listen, in that condition, as weak as he looked physically, Jesus is the highest authority on earth at that moment. Caesar's power couldn't even touch him. And Pilate, he's simply a pawn of Caesar. And Jesus looks at the governor and says, you are not who you think you are. Jesus is declaring what we all know is that God rules the affairs of humanity. God, that's what Jesus is telling Pilate. Listen, listen, authority comes from God. God is the one who rules the affairs of humanity. And we see that all over the word of God. We could spend a lot of time looking at that reality. But, but one, a few verses that stand out to me are uh, Daniel chapter 2. This is King Nebuchadnezzar. After he is humbled, he says this, King Nebuchadnezzar, blessed be the name of God forever and ever. 
to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets in kings. Daniel 4. This sentence is by the decree of the watchers, a decision by the word of the holy ones, to the end that the living may know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men. The Most High does what? Rules the kingdom of men. This is what Jesus is telling Pilate. Somebody else is in charge, and it's not you. The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of of the Lord. He turns it wherever he wills. Pilate's confused. Pilate's confused. Jesus is setting him straight. Pilate says, you're not going to answer me? How dare you not answer me? Don't you realize who I am? Don't you realize I have power over you? Listen, Pilate, things are not always what they seem, buddy. Things are not always what they seem. There was a cowboy that went to buy life insurance. Cowboys need life insurance. It's a rough job. And the life insurance agent says, have you had any accidents lately? Cowboy says, no, but I was kicked by a horse, chased by a raging bull, and bitten by a snake. And the agent says, those weren't accidents. He said, nope, they did it all on purpose. (laughs) Things are not always what they seem. Why? Listen, because standing next to Caesar's representative is a bruised and a bloodied, physically weak man. They're not always what they seem, Pilate. You think you're in charge. You think you understand the situation. And this physically weak man, the world mocks. The world would consider to be the weakest, whom the world would consider defeated. But, but... Those weren't all accidents. No, they weren't all accidents. They did them all on purpose. But the broken and bloodied human skin of Jesus was an earthly reflection of God's divine purposes. God's divine purposes. Standing before Pilate was divinity clothed in humanity. But all he could see was weakness. What do we see? when we see Christ. And may we not be confused like Pilate and the crowd and the Jewish authorities. May we not be confused. May we not forget who God is. May we not lose sight of the fact that God rules in the affairs of man. I was reminded of 1 Corinthians 1. This is such a fitting scripture for what we're seeing in our mind's eye here. Authority and power with the the, the sword of Rome at his side, the ability to to send Jesus to be flogged. And you see Roman authority in Pilate, and you see weakness and physical weakness in Christ. And you see Christ telling Pilate in his bloodied condition, you don't have authority like you think you do. It reminded me of 1 Corinthians 1, for the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. What does that mean? It means this weakness became Pilate's shame. This weakness became Pilate's shame. King of glory is scourged like a criminal. The Roman governor is confused about his authority. And standing right there in the middle of Roman rule and of Jewish hypocrisy, standing right there is the bruised and the bloodied, eternal and all-powerful God. Can you see him? One? Two? Which is clear. Can you see him? Everyone there saw him. Everyone there saw him. Because the Son of God is there for all to see. He's there for all to see. Pilate brought him out. He brought him out. We we didn't talk about this earlier. Look back to verse 5. Pilate brought him out. We read it earlier. So Jesus came out after, 
After the flogging, after the scourging, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Behold the man. Behold the man. Pilate brought out Jesus after the scourging, the brutal beating that left him on the doorstep of death. Pilate brought Jesus out to the crowd and he said, Behold the man. What does it mean, behold the man? The, the language in the Greek gives this picture. It gives a picture of him, Pilate, bringing Jesus out, bruised, bloodied, open, counting his ribs, crown of thorns, blood all over his head and face, limping, leaning over. You know, later he can't carry his cross, right? Simon of Cyrene has to carry his cross. He has no strength to carry his cross. Jesus is, is weak, certainly propped up. Pilate brings him out in front of the crowd. What does he mean when he says, behold the man? The language really says this. He's saying, look at this poor man. Look at him. Look at this pitiful man. That's what Pilate is trying to get them to see. He's trying to, look, I, I, I beat him. I scourged him. I punished him. You said he was king of the Jews, and he was not. You said he was an insurrectionist. And listen, whatever his charge is, listen, I've beat him for you. Now, behold this poor man. Look at this poor man. Have, why don't you have pity on him? What was the reaction of the authorities after Pilate presents him as this poor, pitiful man? What do, what do, what do they say? It's almost unfathomable to consider this if you really stop and think about it. I don't think there's anyone in this room. I, I, I would think there's, we would, I think we would all think that there would be no one in this room who would respond like these people respond. That if we saw somebody at the doorstep of death, as Jesus was, that they would ever say, John 19, 6, when the chief priests and the officers saw him, behold the man, Pilate says, look at him. Look at him. Look at this poor man. I've done this. I've punished him. Look at him. Look what the verse says in verse 6. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they saw him. We only have our mind's eye. And when we see it in our mind's eye, we are revulsed. They saw it with their physical eyes. They saw him, and their response was not sympathy. They cried out, crucify him. Crucify him. The depth of depravity in the heart of man is greater than we can ever imagine. All the chief priests could see a man. All they could see was a man they were jealous of. So instead of seeing a man that was beaten into the point of death, all they saw was a man they were jealous of. All they saw was a man they were, they were jealous of his power. They were jealous of his influence over the crowds. That's all they could see. And so they worked up a mob mentality within the crowd, and they were shouting, crucify him, away with him. The man Pilate ushered out to be gawked at and reviled at, the man that they had no reverence for, was God in the flesh. Philippians 2 says this about the bruised and bloody Jesus. Philippians 2, starting in verse 5, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. It's powerful. Jesus did not. Hold on to his divine rights and privileges. That's what it means that he emptied himself. He did not hold on to his divine rights and privileges. He, he emptied himself or he let go of the rights of divinity while he walked the earth. Listen, he humbled himself through the putting on of human flesh. And we see here in this account the pinnacle example of the humility of Christ. Jesus submitting himself to the will of the Father to be beaten and tortured and then ultimately killed. And Pilate says, behold the man, look at him. And he said it when he said, behold the man, he's saying it from an elevated position over Jesus. And he felt like he had control over him, that he could determine Jesus' fate, but Jesus was in perfect control. 
Standing there, he looked completely weak and vulnerable. Pilate, Pilate looked apart, didn't he? He looked apart of the ruling authority. Pilate looked apart. He would, he would have bought into the, the mantra, fake it till you make it. Huffington Post wrote an article in 2022 called Fake It Till You Make It Isn't Just a Cliché. You know what the new term now is? Because fake it till you make it sounds strange. Uh, Here's a new term, behavioral activation. Behavioral activation. Here's what behavioral activation means. Here's what fake it till you make it. Here's what it means. Look the part long enough, fake it long enough, and you'll convince yourself, and then you'll start living up to who you desire to be. Behavioral activation. Jesus didn't look the part, but Jesus didn't get the memo from the Huffington Post. Here's what's true about Jesus. Matthew 26. He wasn't faking it till he made it. Listen, look, Matthew 26, verse 53. Do you not think that I cannot appeal to my Father and he will at once send more than 12 legions of angels? Do you not think? I'm not faking it till I make it. I know what I can do. But what was Jesus leaning into here? What do you see in your mind's eye? After this declaration that Jesus said in Matthew 26 that he could call for legions of angels to deliver him from this, look what we see. Verse 38. Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little further, he fell on his face and he prayed, saying, My father, my father, if it be possible, let this cut pass for me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Perfect glory, eternal God, could have stopped it all in a moment, but he leaned into what was to come. He leaned into Obedience to his father's will. He leaned in to walking closer to the scourging that we read about earlier. He leaned into going in that direction. He was the the eternal God wrapped in flesh. Pilate was simply a pawn of Caesar. And when we see this picture and this contrast, it shows you the depth of the love of Christ. He could have stopped it all. But what we see, what we see, why did he do it? Why did he subject himself all? To all of this. It was because of love. That's why. Greater love has no one than to lay down your life for your friend. The love of God is why he did it. The love of God is why he absorbed the blows that he could have stopped. You remember those soldiers that went to arrest him? As we read in John 9 earlier in our study, and Jesus, and they're looking for Jesus, and whom do you seek? And They say Jesus of Nazareth, and Jesus says, I am he. Perhaps some of those soldiers that fell to the ground under the power of the I am statement of God, perhaps they they were ones that were a part of the scourging and the flogging. He could have stopped them in their tracks at any moment, but why did he lean into it? Because he, because he loves. He did it because of love. For God so loved the world that he gave. His only son. Oscar Hammerstein famously said, a bell is not a bell until you ring it. A song is not a song until you sing it. And love in the heart is not put there to stay. Love isn't love till you give it away. Love isn't love till you give it away. And Jesus gave it all. He gave it all. He gave it all the way. He laid it all down. So my question for you today is, is, is have you come to know the love of God in the person and work of Jesus Christ? Have you come to know the love of God? What do you see in your mind's eye? I see the love of God. Standing right there in Pilate's headquarters was a bruised and severely beaten Jesus. Standing right there in Pilate's headquarters was the one who would atone for the sins of, you, of, of humanity, for the sins of many. What do I see? I see, oh, precious is the blood. That's what I see. 
What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. Standing right there in Pilate's headquarters was the love of God. Because of his great love, the king of glory was scourged like a criminal. And there were many eyes present that day that saw Jesus, and they could really only see one thing. They saw weakness and defeat. So what about your eyes today? Have you missed your appointment? You missed your appointment? You've gone to the doctor lately? You missed your appointment? I think it's time for a checkup. Here's a question for you to ponder. What things have been clouding your vision of Christ? And you know, when you consider all that we've seen today in this text of who Jesus is and the depth to which he went for us, what things in our lives are clouding our vision of Jesus? Wow. So my question to you this morning is, which is clearer? One? The worldly perspective of Christ? One? Is that what you see of Christ? The worldly perspective about Christ? Or two? Behold the man. Behold the Son of God and the Son of Man who put on flesh, scourged and exposed, and yet powerfully in control and submitted to the will of the Father. What do you see? One, the worldly perspective of Christ that He was just a good teacher, was just a good man, just came to do good deeds, just came to, to, to deal with all the injustices of our society. Do you see? Is that the vision you see of Christ? Or do you see two? Do you see the, the real vision of Christ? A failure in the eyes of the people, but there is Jesus is this what you see of Christ? One step closer to purchasing the full victory that his cross alone could accomplish. Behold the man. May we have eyes to see Jesus correctly. May we not allow the things of this world. May we not allow the busyness of our life. May we not allow er earthly, worldly distractions to cloud our vision of Christ. May we behold him. May we see him. Because I believe when we see him for who he is, we will serve him with all of our life. When we see him for who he is, and when we see him for what he has done, we will give all that we are. There will be no earthly distraction. There will be no earthly weight. There will be no earthly suffering. There will be no earthly sin that will prevent us from giving our all when we see him correctly, when we change our lenses, when we get rid of our old prescription and we throw away the earthly distractions of this world and we see Christ for who he is and what he's done and what he's accomplished for us, we will give our all to him. We'll give our all. Amen. Behold the man. Behold the Son of God.